Cambridge University, who will be talking on empathizing with and ascribing more value to which organisms. First, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I will try to continue uh, the provocative uh, tone of the discussion, which has started with, uh, with, with Jean Frank. Uh, and uh, so, what I'm going to do in this uh, talk, I'm going to say a bit about empathy and the other concepts which are related to it. I'm going to say how it relates to moral behavior and perhaps to the concept of God. Uh, it gives some examples of empathy in uh, non-humans, uh, say to which animals do humans direct empathy, uh, to talk a bit about moral value and then go on. Okay, so I'll say a bit about sentience, which is relevant to the question of which animals we direct empathy to, and consider which animals are sentient, and here are some which can, could be considered, and then I'll say a little bit about how we associate these ideas with how we actually treat the animals, uh, evaluating welfare and considering which animals we might protect. Uh, and I know that in what I am going to say, a number of the other speakers who are coming later are going to say some of the same things and pick up some of the things which I'm mentioning. Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, we, are, we, are, we are all on the same theme and we are, so it, it, there, we are going to, I think we will probably manage not to duplicate too much. I'll try to not to say the same thing that Giancarlo said and so on. Okay, so where does it come from, this concept of empathy? Uh, I think uh, that it started with Ein Fühlung in German uh, and was uh, only, it is only about a hundred years that we have been using it at all uh, in English and it wasn't, wasn't used very much in English until about 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, and so most of the references are of relatively recent things written in English. There are earlier references uh, in German. And so here are some statements. I'm going to say something about what I think the term means, and then I'm going to also say what other terms mean. So excuse me for presenting this uh, in, 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 in English, and thank you very much for listening to me in English, to everybody uh, here. So, uh, O'Connell suggested empathy is the capacity to understand the experience of another person or an animal cognitively and emotionally. Um, and I would say that it's not the capacity to do this, it's actually doing it, it's the process of doing it. But otherwise I think that's quite a useful definition. Here is another one, Planau, empathy is taking the other person's perspective. This refers to person, and that would mean you couldn't have empathy with anything other than a person. So it depends how you, depends how you define person, but generally I think it's better to use the word individual. So the definition which I use, and which I wrote in a book in 2003, is empathy is the process of understanding the experience of another individual cognitively and emotionally. And there is another term which people sometimes use, which is cognitive empathy, uh, which is actually being able to put yourself in the position mentally uh, with another individual. Okay, some of the other words. Is the sound okay? Yes. It's not too loud or... Yes. Thank you. Um, another word is pity. That means to be sorry for another individual. I'm giving dictionary definitions here, implying showing, implying what you do about it. You show mercy or tenderness or grief. And then there is another word which is compassion, and that implies very often that you are suffering with another, uh, that you are in sympathy with another and suffering with them. Again, these are dictionary uh, definitions. And sympathy is an affinity that results in the corresponding effect of an influencing factor, or the heightened awareness of the suffering of another individual, which is something which ought to, you ought to do something about it. So these words then uh, imply that you do something about it. If you have sympathy, if you feel compassion, generally speaking it means you do something about it. 
Empathy, I think, you don't necessarily do something about it. You might do, but you need not. So you can, you can feel empathy without doing anything. Uh, you may follow it by doing something. So you may feel empathy and you may then act in a compassionate way towards an individual, but the empathy could be in, in more than one direction. You could have a variety of different kinds of feelings. Empathy is not limited to, feel, to, to feeling pity. Empathy can mean other kinds of feelings, about the, other kinds of uh, putting yourself in the place of the other. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit wider term. It doesn't necessarily imply that uh, you do something. Then how does this word empathy relate to moral decisions and moral behaviour? So here are some, again, a statement by Rob Schaefer, uh, who uh, is saying that uh, what you actually decide to do often depends on your deductions about the feelings of other individuals. You are doing that when you are deciding what to do. It also depends on your own feelings and Rod Schaefer says that uh, empathy is impor an important part of these mechanisms uh, and it's especially the emotional components. So these are Rod Schaefer's words, not mine, although I, I, I agree with them. And Rod Schaefer also says that all of this uh, can be related can relate to a range of species, not just to humans. And then again, another quote from Planal that empathy and other feelings have an important role in moral behaviour. And I think this is something which has come up in relation to what uh, uh, Joe Franco has been saying already. And then Hoffman bring, brought in the idea of, of, of how empathy is uh, uh, related to the development of behaviour. We've had a significant discussion about that uh, already. And again, it seemed that Hoffman agreed with what Jan Franco said, that is that you have to have certain capabilities in order to be able to feel empathy. You have to have a certain kind of brain functioning, but you are actually uh, changing it according to the experiences which you have. And uh, I have to say I agree completely with what you say. I think that if you think about people encountering other animals, uh, it's not just when you are a small child that you may change your view. So somebody might get a job as a technician in a laboratory. They got the job because they needed a job. They start working with animals in the laboratory and they, they develop much more empathy for the animals. Or it may be they redevelop it from their childhood. So people can change in how they are feeling and, and empathy, you can have more empathy at one time of life than another because of the experiences which you have. And I think we can find quite a lot of examples of that. So, a general important point uh, which uh, is that uh, establishing good relationships, having effective communication with others is, more effect, is, is better if you try to see the other individual's view of the situation. And putting yourself in the position of another makes you more accurate in your ability to communicate with them and to convey information usefully to them. And generally speaking, the more communication there is, the more empathy there is. And I think we have more empathy in the world now because we have more communication. Okay, so morality. Uh, a thing which I argued in uh, my book in 2003 is, uh, which has also been argued by several other writers, that uh, human morality has parallels in societies of other animals. Uh, that there is, uh, we have empathy for a number of individuals, as uh, was, has already been mentioned, not, not everybody and not equally, but uh, that is something which is changing in human society. Uh, and these empathic feelings throughout the world, that is, a lot of people having empathy for a lot of other people, can be thought of as a, a, a common spirit around the world. Just as when you have a lot of individuals feeling empathy, it, then there is something uh, which is more than an individual in a sense. So if you can think of it as a common spirit. The human actions are not occurring in isolation, and so the, the spirit is something which is more than an individual and involved in a lot of actions. Um, 
And this idea of a, of a common spirit is something which is of great importance in human societies uh, and probably uh, possibly in other sentient beings. And this, I think, can be thought of as the, say, an, an essential part of the concept of God. And so I get, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. So the idea of God as a spirit linking sentient beings, I think, fits with the idea that group empathy underlies moral codes. And the so, so there is a, a, a link to, the, to what religion is all about. Empathy is to do with moral functioning, and moral functioning is something which underlies all religions. And I'm talking about not just one, but all, all, all the major religions. Okay, so let's think of some examples of non-human situations which might involve empathy. And I'll give you some examples which of, of people have written about. So Franz de Waal suggested, and uh, there are going to be a lot more examples, I'll go through them quite quickly, uh, but uh, Franz de Waal suggested that when uh, there is, was a chimpanzee about to give birth, other chimpanzees were paying a lot of attention to that female, they were treating her differently than they would normally, and so something they were observing was changing their behaviour towards her, and on one occasion there was defence of that female by one of her close associates, one of her friends, uh, short, shortly after she had given birth, and it seems that to me quite straightforward to say this involved some degree of empathy in these chimpanzees. They are, they are observing something and to some degree it seems quite logical to me that they are putting themselves in the position of the other individual. Another example from, uh, from Deval and uh, Deval and Aurelie, uh, they described distress in groups of chimpanzees and the distress spread in the groups and again that might be associated with empathy in those individuals. Another different kind of example is you have individuals which have a relationship where one does something which is helpful to the other and in turn receives a benefit. So the, the, the cleaner fish, which live on reefs, they live on coral reefs, other reefs in the sea, these small fish feed on parasites and uh, superfluous material on the surface of larger fish. They get a benefit because they get food from these uh, larger fish. What they take doesn't in any way harm the larger fish. In fact, it greatly benefits the larger fish because they are removing parasites from the surface of the fish. So they, they come together and they uh, are, have this mutually beneficial relationship. When they are doing that, it could be that to some degree they are aware of what is happening to the other individual, or it could be that it's entirely a, a I am getting my breakfast kind of situation. But it's, uh, it, 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 it may be that there is some degree of empathy between these individuals. And it's difficult to describe the relationship without thinking uh, in terms of empathy. Here's another uh, example. Sue Savage Rumbau uh, was a writer working uh, with uh, an orangutan, and this orangutan had an, an amputated arm. The arm had previously been, uh, been injured and removed, and this orangutan with the uh, 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 amputated arm, when uh, the orangutan encountered her, uh, she had a, an amputated finger, and the orangutan looked at the amputated finger and put the finger against her own stump, and then looked at uh, looked at the, the, the researcher, the woman, Sue Savage Romba. So it seemed that there was a realization where well, we both have something which has happened to us, which means we lost part of our anatomy. And that uh, maybe involves sympathy or, uh, to some extent, empathy. Some more examples. One which is often discussed by biologists is. In groups of birds, groups of mammals, there are sometimes alarm calls which are given, which uh, indicate to all in the group that there is some kind of danger. Sometimes it is a specific alarm call which indicates what the, 
danger is, that is, it is a large predator like a human walking towards us, or it is a, uh, a bird of prey flying overhead, or it is a snake crawling along the ground. Sometimes it's a specific uh, call, so for some birds and some mammals have alarm calls which say what the danger is. Um, these alarm calls are given, they do save the lives of many good living animals. Uh, the animals which are saved need not be relatives, they may be relatives but they may not be. Um, they may not even be the same species, you can get flocks of birds of different species. Uh, the predators often attack, in, in some studies at least, individuals like the ground squirrels in Sherman's study. The ones which gave the alarm calls were in fact putting themselves at some risk. They, so giving alarm calls can be risky. So all of those things put together, alarm calling has been suggested to be just something which uh, diverts attention from the caller and makes somebody else the one which is at risk. In fact, it seems that it is, has a particular advantage of, um, of helping other members of that social group uh, and that there are, uh, there, are, there are risks associated with it. So um, when the individual is giving the alarm call, are they feeling some empathy for other individuals who might be at risk of the predator? Or is it just something automatic? Uh, it, we, we, we actually don't know exactly, but it could be there's some degree of empathy there. Uh, the, the final thing mentioned here is a, a, a story of a bonobo, uh, and this, this uh, ape was uh, on uh, traveling around an area with some human, with humans, familiar humans, and the, uh, they saw a, a, a predator. Uh, it was a, a mountain lion. It was in America, and it was a mountain lion in a tree. And uh, the bonobo, when it got back to the social group, communicated to the others uh, exactly how what was said, uh, the scientists didn't know. But what they knew was that there was a lot of excited noise in this group of bonobos when they got back to the group which were in the, uh, the living area. And subsequently, other individuals went out. And when they got to the place where the mountain lion had been in the tree, uh, they were uh, expressing, uh, they were looking rather cautious and uh, looking fearful. So it looked as though there had been communication by one, by one individual to the other individuals about something which could be dangerous in a particular area, or I don't know how specifically, whether it was really to one tree, but they seem to have communicated. So, uh, again, in order to do that, it's difficult to see that it happens without there being some degree of empathy. Another one which is very widely reported is dolphins and porpoises lifting human swimmers towards the surface, uh, and in some cases, in fact, uh, saving them. There are reported cases of, of, of people being saved by dolphins who uh, lifted them up. And so they had the idea that these humans need air in the same way that dolphins and porpoises need air. So if you lift them up, they, they, they will survive. And it's difficult to see how that could be done without the dolphin or porpoise having the concept that these humans need to have air uh, and to have some degree of empathy with that human. And then we can come to some things which we're going to hear some nice examples of later on today. Do predictions by pets or working animals of the likely actions of humans uh, involve empathy with humans? So when the dogs and horses, which we'll hear about later, are uh, acting in the way they do, are they indicating that they have an appreciation of what it is like to be the human? Let's go in the other direction. To which animals do we direct empathy? And as you all know, there is variation in how much people would try to put themselves in the place of, of, of other animals. For some people, they don't do it for any non-human. For other people, but actually, I think most people do. Just as soon as they have any experience of interacting with animals, uh, as, as a pet or as a working animal or as an animal on a, on a, on a farm, uh, there is much more likelihood that they will. So, which animals do we, do, do, do we feel empathy to 
which animals? So James Circle in his book in 1986 said, the animals which give us the most benefit evoke the greatest empathy, especially farm animals and companion animals. Uh, another suggestion was by, by Stan Curtis and uh, his co-worker Gunther uh, suggested that empathy for other animals is greater in communities where humans rely more on animals for food. And that view was, has been questioned by some people. For example, Clive Phillips in a paper on empathy pointed out that there isn't actually very good evidence for that. Uh, what Serpil says seemed to be right, but what Curtis and Gunter said uh, doesn't quite fit with the idea of the Buddhist concern not to harm any kind of animals. Uh, and then the, the people in the world who are most reliant on animals for food are Inuit people, Eskimo people. Uh, most of their diet is animals. They have eat very little which is not animals. Uh, but are they the people who are most caring about animals? Uh, probably, probably not. I mean, some of them are caring, but uh, probably generally they're not. And uh, Clive Phillips in his paper suggests some other things about empathy. He says he thinks women have more empathy than men, that humans have more empathy for animals which are cared for in or close to their homes. He says he thinks there's greater empathy for younger animals which need more care, and that the caring attitude is a consequence of caring behavior rather than the other way around. But when I read that, I am not sure that he is talking about empathy. I think he's partly talking about compassion, uh, which, uh, and empathy can be associated with compassion, but it's not always. So I think Clive Phillips there is talking about compassion rather than empathy, but some of what he says uh, uh, seems still seems logical to me. Um, and as, as, as uh, Jan Franco said already, empathy occurs in young people before they have started to show caring behavior. Uh, they are, they, very young children are feeling, uh, it seems, that they are uh, putting themselves in the position of the other individual, which is a, which is a human or a non-human, and they are doing that before they are actually caring in a practical sense for others. Um, and then also I have the point which you have already made that males learn to suppress and probably males learn to suppress more than females learn to suppress so maybe both males and females show empathy initially but males are trained to get rid of it and females are allowed to still have it. Okay, so now morality and its origin, I'm going to go on to a few other things. Uh, why do we do what is uh, why, why do we help others? Why do we make efforts not to harm others? And the answer to that is that uh, if you want to live in a social group for a long time, then you need to be careful not to harm other individuals in the group. And uh, the whole thing fails if you show behaviour which harms others. It doesn't mean you never harm them, but most of the time you are very careful not to harm them. So, avoiding not causing harm to other individuals is the fundamental aspect of, of morality in social groups. And here are some animals with some big weapons, they have pointed horns. They hardly ever touch another individual with their horns. They are very careful not to do it. And when elephants walk around in groups, they do not tread on other elephants or indeed any other living things most of the time. Uh, and when, when you are walking down the street, uh, on your way here this morning, if you were walking down the street, you probably didn't knock anybody over. You probably didn't push anybody under a bus. You were really quite careful not to harm anybody. We do it all the time. It's a very important part of our basic behavior. We try very hard not to uh, cause harm to other individuals. It's a fundamental thing about our society uh, and uh, it's actually something which is a, an important behavior for the stability of social groups. So not causing harm in particular and, to, and sometimes act actively helping others are uh, actions which are uh, very valuable in society. So this is why morality has evolved in social animals like, like humans. And uh, as I mentioned, religions are a basis for that. Okay, 
So what is a moral agent is the next question. Uh, what, to what extent are these questions about empathy related to uh, whether another individual is a subject of moral action or can behave in a moral way? So some people have limited the term moral agent to human beings. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and, but uh, sometimes there are more. So there is a variety. Here are some statements which people have made. Some people do not think of non-humans as moral agents at all. Other people do. Uh, but uh, I think the tendency has been that in recent years that more and more philosophers are allowing the possibility that non-humans can be moral agents and can be the subjects of moral actions. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we have more statements of that, of that kind, I think. Uh, but that's, it's still the case that the vast majority of people do not think of non-humans as being uh, moral agents and uh, I'm not necessarily convinced that moral behaviour should need to be directed towards non-humans. But one of the things which alters people's ideas about which animals should be the subject of moral actions is their cognitive ability and their capacity to show feelings. And this is where the term sentience comes in. So uh, we have statements going back to 1996, a sentient being is one capable of having feelings and uh, sentience is a capacity to feel something. Uh, so sentience basically means having the awareness and cognitive ability necessary to have feelings. And uh, it implies a range of abilities. It does, sentience doesn't mean actually having the feeling, it means having the capability to have, have, have the feeling. And an individual can be sentient when it is not having feelings. So you, you, you don't have to be, having a, to be having a feeling in order to be considered sentient. You can be sentient at other times as well. We are all, we are all sentient. Uh, so what abilities are needed for that? Well, here's a list of some of the abilities and uh, to evaluate the, the actions of others in relation to yourself and others, to remember some of these actions, to assess risks and benefits, have some feelings, have some degree of awareness. So this term, sentience, is now being more widely used and we have it in legislation now. Sentient beings is in the, is in the EU legislation. Another general point, I would, which is perhaps also relevant to this discussion, is how do we decide what we should do and what we should not do? And I think most of us feel that we have obligations to other individuals. And I personally find that the best way to think of things. It's better to talk in terms of your own obligations than to talk in terms of rights or freedoms, because asserting rights and freedoms can cause problems. So most of us would say we have some obligations not to harm others, and others would include non-humans as well as humans. But then there's the question of in what circumstances are you? Is it acceptable to harm others? Uh, if, if, a, 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 if you are about to be killed by another animal, you may kill it. If you are, uh, it, so there are circumstances for everybody. Or if you're about to be bitten by a mosquito, you may stop the mosquito from biting you. This is an animal, and you are killing it. So we are all killing animals all the time, uh, and we kill animals in producing uh, our food. Uh, all plant production involves the killing of large numbers of animals. Uh, so nobody has avoided killing animals, uh, but. We have, so we feel we have obligations to some of these animals, and what are these obligations? Uh, so we have, for, in some cases, we consider our obligations in relation to killing, and on the whole, I think most people will try not to kill other individual animals, but some people actually spend all their spare time killing animals for amusement. So there's a range of views on this. Um, also, uh, most of us would say we should ensure that the welfare of animals is good, uh, that we have other obligations to animals, like uh, conservation. So to win, what are the kind of animals that we have these, have these views? Um, well, I put a definition of awareness, I think I'm going to we'll go over that, but just to say we can define these terms. Uh, I think I don't have time to do that now. Um, right, I'm going to go on. Oh, uh, perhaps it's just worth saying, one of the factors that people often present is that we should be considering whether the individual is self-aware. Self-awareness is something which has had a lot of discussion. 
I think we're going to hear some more about it from other people later, so I will just leave it at that point here. Uh, I think it's been overstated in terms of its, uh, in, in, in terms of its uh, relevance. But it, it'll, it'll come up again in some of our further examples. So, which animals are sentient? And also, which people are sentient? So, is a newborn baby sentient? Well, I just listed the qualities of a being which is sentient. There is no question that a newborn baby is not sentient. The, 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 as far as I'm concerned, a newborn baby is not sentient. It doesn't have those abilities. It has the potential to have those abilities, but it doesn't have them at the moment. Uh, also, there are people who have their brains damaged, uh, maybe because of, of Alzheimer's or, or because of an accident, and they, are, they don't have this capability. They are not sentient. So there are quite a few humans who are not sentient because they are, haven't developed enough or because they have lost the ability. So it's not the case that all humans are, are, are sentient, uh, and it's not the case that all of animals which are sentient, they are not born sentient, they have the potential to be sentient, and they develop the capabilities which we count as being sentient. Uh, but probably, if you are attending this talk, you are sentient. So, don't worry. Okay, how, which animals are sentient? How clever are various kinds of animals? This is something which is a really interesting topic, and again, we're going to get some nice examples. I'll just give you a few examples of this, and uh, uh, you can read about it in books on cognition. You can read, uh, you're going to hear from Ludwig later, but there are, uh, there are a lot of things written about this. So here are a few examples. So this is a study done by Keith Kendrick at Abraham Institute in Cambridge in the UK. And he is recording from cells in the brain of sheep. And when he recorded from these cells, in what you see on the, on the right hand side uh, is the firing of the cells. And next to it, you see pictures which were shown to the animal. So the top four are pictures. This is a particular cell in the brain. And it's firing when the sheep, when the sheep is seeing a picture of another sheep with horns. Uh, and it, not, it didn't fire when it's shown other kinds of pictures. So it is a unit in the brain which responds to seeing another sheep with horns. Then another, uh, a, 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 another study, which, a, 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 in, a, in another part of the same study, he showed a sheep, a pattern, or a goat, or a sheep with horns, or a sheep with horns, or another sheep with horns. And it fired only to one sheep. Whatever was shown to it, it had to be a particular individual sheep. It wasn't a, in this case, it wasn't all sheep with horns, it was only Mary. If it wasn't Mary, then the unit didn't fire. So this is a unit in the brain which allows the, uh, uh, helps with the identification of an individual. Kendrick also did studies showing that sheep could discriminate photographs of sheep, other sheep, they could remember this discrimination for uh, one or two years. Uh, youth, mothers, recognize their lambs. Uh, there are particular changes in the brain when they recognize their lambs uh, in emotional centers, which are controlling their feelings, as well as in cognitive centers, which are controlling their actual discrimination ability and evaluation ability. Another different example, this is a, a study done by César Arge in the University of São Paulo in Brazil, and he did something which a lot of dog owners have done. A uh, dog is given commands like point at the ball, or fetch the bottle, or get the toy bear. And the dog, was, which happened to be a female, was successful in doing this. These are things which people do with their, with their pet dogs. And then he moved on to have a, a keyboard for the dog, and uh, the dog could press one of eight symbols on the keyboard. Uh, it could respond, what is this, and press the right symbol on the keyboard, or it could indicate what she wanted, so she could say, I want water, I want you to stroke me, I want to urinate, and she could indicate what she wanted to happen in the future. So the dog has an ability to link what is on the keyboard with what actions were occurring in the past or were 
hoped for by the dog in the future. Irene Pepperberg uh, has worked for, worked for many years with an African grey parrot. Parrots are very useful animals for humans to work with because they can use our words. And that's one of the reasons why we think parrots are extraordinarily clever, uh, because we can train them. And it's harder to train other kinds of animals, and you'll hear some examples of efforts to do this uh, later. But, uh, so this African grey parrot could use words for 50 different objects. So you show the parrot the object and the parrot says the word, or the parrot says the word and you give it the object. You could do it in either direction. Seven different colours, five different shapes, number quantities from one to six. The parrot can use words for all of these things. So it can say, there are three blue balls, uh, when you give it three blue balls. So parrot, the, the, it was possible to do all those things. Here's uh, another, and I, I've left out examples of the people who are going to speak later here. So these are mostly other people's work. So Adam McClose in, in Budapest, uh, he demonstrated quite a time ago now that a dog could learn to make a detour around a fence to get uh, a reward. Uh, whereas, and, and this has also been done for other species, for example chickens. At one time people said chickens couldn't do this, but actually if you train them, it's not very difficult to train them to do it. Uh, they can do it. Here's another example. Mike Mendel, uh, working in, in Bristol. A uh, pig was allowed to find hidden food. The following day, the pig remembered where the food was. So, this kind of uh, evidence shows that the animals have a concept of an object when the object is not there. They have a concept of a symbol or an action which can be linked to a particular object. They have a concept of a, an actual pressing a key, walking around the fence, uh, finding particular cues. Uh, there are a whole set of concepts. You can say what concepts the animal must have in order to be able to do these things. And we are now getting quite a large uh, repertoire of evidence of what kind of concepts animals have. And I think it's what concepts they have which is really important. Fine, thank you. So when a, one of the tests which has been done is to see whether the animal can I, uh, work out what it sees in the mirror. It's something which is done with young children as well, except that young children are told from a very early age what the mirror is. So it's very difficult to work with children uh, because they already know what the mirror is because somebody told them this. Um, so, uh, do they have a concept of what is in the mirror? And we are, we are now in the situation where uh, having, being able to use information from a mirror has been demonstrated uh, for humans, uh, and actually for where children are not told what it is, they are about three years old before they can do it. But if you tell them, they can do it when they're younger. But if they haven't been told, it's about three years old before they can use information from the mirror. Uh, so humans, chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, dolphins, pigs, an elephant, a parrot, and magpies have all been shown to be able to use information from a mirror. And they're probably out of date, there's probably more to add onto the list. There have also been attempts with a lot of other species which were not successful. That doesn't mean they, in some cases, because it's actually quite a difficult thing to do, to train it. And I'll give you an example of how you can do it, because we did it with, we did it with pigs. And so what we did was we uh, showed pigs which had never seen a mirror before, or never seen anything reflected before, we showed them a mirror and we gave them a task where they could see in the mirror a familiar coloured food bowl which they could recognise. And this is, was the setup for it. So the, uh, the pig is put... So, okay, the pig is put in a small pen in the bottom right. Uh, there is a barrier which is preventing it from seeing the food bowl, which is coloured blue. And there is a mirror. Thank you very much. So I'm holding that. Right. Okay, so the pig is looking from here. It can see the object. The object is actually in this position. Uh, and, but it looks as though it's behind the mirror. So, um, 
So it can't be seen directly. There is a fan to stop it, locating it by odor. In fact, it's all controlled experimentally. So what happened when the pig had never seen a mirror before is that the pig is in this pen. The door is opened. The pig is looking over here, and it comes out here, and it goes behind the mirror, apparently looking for the food behind the mirror. So when it has never seen a mirror before, it goes to the apparent position of the food. And then we gave them uh, five hours of experience with the mirror. And so there's the pig having the experience with the mirror. And what happened then, after this, was that uh, most of the animals, they could see in the mirror the object. And when the door was opened, they went away from the mirror, around the barrier, to the object. So they had learned that what you see in a mirror is, uh, gives you some useful information and it tells you where things are. So in fact, the pig has observed features of its surroundings, it's remembered these, it's remembered its own actions when it was in front of the mirror, and deduced from that that what you see in the mirror is on this side of the mirror and at a certain position in relation to where you are, and then later use that information uh, to, to, to get to the food. So, and I had a BBC television group who said, oh, we want to replicate this in our studio. <coughs> I said, it's going to be very difficult to do that. But actually, they spent two weeks doing it and they did succeed in replicating it. Uh, there is a Dutch group who has tried to replicate it and they so far haven't quite done so. Okay, let's go on to some other examples. Here's, here's another example of... This is work done by Nicky Clayton and Tony Dickinson and Nathan Emery and their team in working in Cambridge. So, jays, these birds, uh, hide food. The wild birds hide food and then they find it again later. The same as uh, squirrels will also do this. <coughs> they put the birds in the situation where they could hide food. There are a lot of results from this work, but I'll just give you one example. If they had hidden a peanut, they would they might leave it for quite a long time before they went to find it again. Maybe even a week or two before they went and found it again. However, another item of food was a mealworm, the larva of an insect, live, which is alive. They would hide that also, but they would always go back and find it within two days. Because if you hide a mealworm, it's going to go bad and be inedible. So they distinguish between something which would go bad and something which would not go bad. And that means they have the concept that in the future, this, and this bit of food is not going to be edible. Therefore, I will uh, go back and find it uh, earlier. And another thing they did was if, if they were hiding food, and while they were hiding the food, another jay was watching them, they would often delay, uh, they would either delay the hiding, or they would hide the food, and then they would go back again shortly afterwards and move it somewhere else. Because if another jay was watching, it might well steal the food which had been hidden. So they have the concept that the other, the other individual might hide the food, might uh, get the food which had been hidden. Okay, one more of these examples. This is the work of Olga Smirnova working in Moscow. And actually, I haven't seen this published yet, but uh, 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 I don't know whether it is. Ludwig, is it published? Do you know? It is published now. Five minutes more. I'll uh, finish in five minutes. So, Crows were trained. Here are, here are a number of spots. Look at this and then go over there and you will see several possibilities, things with spots on, and you have to choose the same number of spots. So there are three spots here. They could choose, they would find that something with three spots mixed up with lots of others. They learn that very readily. Then and then they get a food reward. Then they're trained that they would get, that, that it had the number, the actual number on, uh, so a number two or a number five, the numbers are up to eight, and they could learn this, so they could associate 
the number, of course our number is nothing to do with uh, a, a, a number of spots really, but they were able to learn that. So that you could put a number five and they would go to five dots, or you could put five dots and they would go to the number five. Uh, and then another thing which was done was to should give them two dots and four dots and the answer was six and they would go to six. Or a number two and a number four and they had to go to the number six and they were able to learn that as well. So these birds are, they have, they have a concept of number up to eight and they can use our symbols for, for the number and they can add numbers together. Okay, another part, another study of Mike Mendel, a pig, watching another pig, it's the same thing as I mentioned with the, with the, the jays. If another pig was watching them, they would, uh, they, 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 so they, could, they, they knew where food was hidden. When they go to, go to the place where it is, if another pig is watching them and that pig is one which could steal from them, then they wait. They don't go to the, get the food until the other pig is not watching. So they retain the information about where the food is until it's safe to get it. So they're judging the situation according to what is possible to do. Uh, here's another one, Adam McClosey. The dog saw a toy being hidden. Human helper arrived and the dog could then uh, point to the uh, object so that the human helper would go and get it. So they have a concept that the human can do things and will do things for them. And this is a, a, a recent one work uh, done with a, a, a cleaner wrasse of the kind that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the, so the cleaner fish is waiting, and there is a queue of big fish waiting to be cleaned by the cleaner fish. They wait there, and they will wait there for quite long periods because being clean is very valuable to them. They want to get the parasites off. Um, what was found was that, if, that, that the cleaner fish would would, if there was a queue of regular clients waiting and another individual came who had not been there before, the cleaner fish would distinguish that one and would clean it first because if it didn't clean it first, it might go away quite quickly. So the cleaner fish wants to get what is on the, the big fish, the parasites and so on, on the surface of the fish. So an individual which was, was not waiting in the queue but which had just arrived for the first time was preferentially cleaned. This was then done experimentally, where two plates of food were offered. One was ephemeral, in that it would only be there for a short time and then it would be taken away. The other one was one which would, would remain there. And what the fish learned was to do the same thing in the experimental situation, that is, they took the ephemeral one first, because if they took the ephemeral one first, they would get both of them, but if they took the other one first, the ephemeral one would be taken away. So this task has also been done with other species. So adult brass, these fish can learn this within 10 trials. It's something that they learn experimentally in the laboratory quite quickly. The same task was done for juvenile brass, and they were not as good at this as the adults. They were, it was done with capuchin monkeys, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And the, 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 the primates were less good at the task than the fish. They, they didn't learn the task as, as well as the fish. And when they reversed the task, so they had to, uh, they did a reversal learning, they had to go for the other cue, um, the um, fish learned the reversal very well, and they, some of the primates did and some of them didn't. It's also been done with parrots, and the parrots learned to do this very effectively, and they also learned the reversal very effectively. So, after this, using this particular kind of study, the, uh, the, the, the parrots are the best at this task. And then the fish, and then some of the primates, and then some of the other primates are not as good. So it's, it's an example of a task where a bird and a fish come out as better than the primates. There are several others like this, especially with birds. This is a study we did with uh, young cattle. The young cattle had to, uh, they are put in this pen, and in, in the pen, uh, the gate can be opened if they put their nose in the hole in the side of the pen, and they can then go down there to get food. 
Here is another animal which has the same, exactly the same experience, but its own actions don't control the opening of the gate. Uh, the, the young cattle learnt this uh, quite quickly, and when they had learnt it, they showed an excited response. So they, showed, they jumped in the air, they changed their behaviour, and they showed increased heart rate when they solved the problem. If they got the reward without having solved the problem, they didn't show this excitement response. So it seemed there was an excitement, the excitement response was associated with having solved the task. Right, I think I'm going on with time. I'll just tell you this one rather quickly. This is a study done by Carla Torres Pereira. The dog has an item of food put on the table or a toy put on the table by the owner. And the owner says, don't touch that. The owner then goes out of the room. And when the owner went out of the room, uh, the, went out for 30 seconds, some dogs would take it and some dogs would not take it. When you compare the two, when the owner came back, the owner stood completely impassively and uh, there was a difference in the behaviour of dogs which had obeyed and dogs which had not obeyed. Uh, they changed, and also a difference in heart rate between the two. So it seemed that when they had done the thing which they were told not to do, there was different behaviour and different physiological response. So maybe this is, uh, the dog is feeling guilt, is what we would say if it was a human. Okay, I'm going on too slowly, so I'll go a little bit quicker and say, when you look at a whole range of different kinds of animals, you find that learning ability is very good in all is, is good in all vertebrates, including especially including fish. It's also good in cephalopods like octopus. Uh, it's quite good in some insects. It's very good in some spiders. Uh, so honeybees can form co um, cognitive mats. Ants can count while they're foraging. Uh, place learning is, can be shown by a variety of animals. Jumping spiders, there's a whole series of papers on these showing very impressive uh, learning ability. Uh, so, the learning ability is present in a wide variety of animals. Pain systems are very clear in mammals, birds, reptiles, fish. Uh, there is now quite good evidence in crabs, lobsters, prawns. Uh, not very good evidence in insects. Uh, Quite good evidence in octopus and other cephalopods, uh, a little bit of evidence in other mollusks like snails, uh, and especially, especially swimming sea snails, which are used in human pain research to check on the functioning of analgesics. Um, so at the moment, then, we could say that the animals which are sentient are all the vertebrates and uh, cephalopod uh, mollusks and decapod crustacea like like uh, uh, crabs and prawns, and um, possibly others. I should stop. Okay, so, I think I won't be able to say anything about it. Uh, so what I'll say about welfare is, that welfare is now something that we can, sorry to be flicking a lot of slides, welfare is now something we can evaluate very precisely, and so, uh, what which animals do we take account of? Uh, uh, in fact, animals which have a high level of cognitive ability are generally going to be better at dealing with problems than animals with less good cognitive ability. So, it might be that, some, that pain is worse for less sophisticated animals than for more sophisticated animals. So, we ought to be thinking about the we ought actually to be evaluating the welfare directly uh, rather than assuming uh, what will be the consequence for the animal. So we shouldn't just have respect for complex animals, we should also be thinking about the welfare of any animal, and that includes invertebrate animals, not just vertebrate animals. So it raises a question of what animals do we value more than others. We could say we value sentient animals. We could say we value large ones, or small ones, or beautiful ones, or rare ones. Which animals do you value, and why do you value those, and is it logical? I think that's the question we need to ask, and we can come back to this question later. How do we decide which ones we value? Uh, and it, 
uh, we, we ought to, well, I'm going to go over that, over that. So, the conclusions. Empathy, then, is a process of understanding the experience of another individual, cognitively and emotionally. Uh, group empathy may underlie moral codes. Non-humans can be the subject of moral actions and can have moral value. Sentience means having the awareness and cognitive ability necessary to have feelings. And good or poor welfare can be evaluated scientifically. Uh, in order to evaluate, we often have to ask, uh, assess how good and how poor the welfare is very precisely, take account of positive and negative feelings in other kinds of animals. And less cognitive ability might mean more difficulty in coping. And so, so sentient animals include the ones in that list there, possibly some others, but the word welfare refers to all animals, whether they are sentient or not. And we can think about when during development individuals become sentient, uh, whether they lose it later, and later if they have a damage to them, and we ought to use proper scientific methods to evaluate the welfare of all animals in taking decisions about what is acceptable behaviour and what is not acceptable behaviour. And uh, so this is the book which I've just written, which came out a few months ago, and this one was a bit early. Thank you very much.